are going to be finishing off this chapter this morning. And so I'd like to begin, let's read our text and then we'll pray. We're going to be looking at verses 6 all the way down to verse 13 as we look at these trumpet judgments from the Lord. It reads in Revelation 8, starting there in verse 6, it says, So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded, and hail and fire followed, mixed with blood, and they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. Then the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became his blood. And a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. And then the third angel sounded. And a great star from heaven fell, burning like a torch. And it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of, of the water. And the name of the star was Wormwood. And a third of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died from the water because it was made bitter. And the fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened. And a third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. And I looked, and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. Father, as we would come across this section, it's real, really ominous, Lord, to, to read it the judgment and the wrath, Lord, that you're pouring out. And yet even in that, Lord, you want us to find comfort that you are a good God, that you are righteous, that you are holy, that you are just, that we would understand your nature, that no sin can stand before you. And Lord, we know that between now and then that you are making every way possible for man to have a relationship with you through your son, Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, may you speak to us through this passage. May you give us warning. May you give us uh, the fear of the Lord. May we have a healthy fear of the Lord. And at the same time, Lord, that we would uh, just be stirred up to live for you all the more. We ask it and pray it in Jesus' name. And the church says, amen. You know, there's a number of reasons why we gather as the church. And it's important that you understand this, that we together collectively understand why we meet on Sundays, why we meet through the, throughout the week. Sundays and Wednesdays and small groups here and small groups there. We do it for relationship's sake, believe it or not. We gather as a church for relationship, for fellowship. That's what's expected of the church according to God's word. But we also gather together to pray, don't we? We pray for one another. Um, in fact, after announcements, I went out and someone pulled me aside and said, hey, there's this prayer request. And right there on the spot, we prayed. And so we pray together. We pray for one another. But we also worship the Lord. We get our eyes fixed on the Lord. We gather to give. We gather to serve. And we also gather to read and to study God's word. I like how the author of Hebrews puts it. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25, it says, Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as in the manner of some, but exhorting one another so much more as you see the day approaching. Do you know what day that is? The day of the Lord. The very topic of which we're studying. And so we gather as a church for all these reasons. To study God's word. To not forsake the assembly together. To encourage each other all the more as we look for this great day of the Lord. And we know that it's beneficial that we're here today. I like what Paul says uh, as he wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.16. He tells us that all scripture is inspired for God and it's profitable so you benefit by gathering as the church, by opening up God's word. We benefit from this. And because of that, we're going to look at every word that comes from the word of God, knowing that we will profit from it, including passages like the one that we just read. A passage of judgment. Uh, it's very much fire and brimstone. And, and yet, how can we benefit from this? What can God teach us from this? Well, we need to remember, guys, keep it all within context. This book, 
this letter that we're studying, it is the revelation of who? Of Jesus Christ. Revelation 1.1, that's how the letter begins. It's the revelation of Jesus. And what exactly does that mean, that there is revelation from him? What's that mean, revelation? Well, remember, in the Greek, that word revelation is apocalypsis. It's where we get the English word apocalypse from. And it means this. It means to disclose something. It means for something to come out from concealment. It is the uncovering, the unveiling to be revealed. It's a disclosure of those things that are hidden. See, guys, it's important we understand this. Revelation reveals to us the things which we could not have known unless they were revealed. And Jesus revealed it to us in this book and in this letter. And it's for that reason we need to study this book and not be afraid of it, not run away from it. It's something that we are called to do, to study to prepare, to anticipate this day of the Lord, the return of Christ. 1 Corinthians 1, 7, Paul says this. He says, see to it that no one comes short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are waiting for this time. We're waiting for the prophecy in Scripture to come to pass. And so we study prophecy. Prophecy is important. We know this. We looked at this in the past. Did you know that one-fourth of your Bible is Bible prophecy? That's over 26% of your Bible. 26, a quarter of your entire Bible is all about things that were to come, things that are to come. And so we study. We want to study this. We want to know it. God's Word is authored by God Himself. And so we're here to study it. And we're studying this passage, Revelation 8, verses 6, all the way down to verse 13. And again, what we find in this section isn't new for us, because we've been studying this, but it's God's wrath. It's God's judgment that's being poured out. And it's interesting because of, of what God targets, or what God specifically is honing in on as we see these trumpet judgments unfold. And what do they target? But they target man's resource. The most important thing that man depends on is the resources of man. God is going to bring judgment on the ecology of the world. We're talking nature. We're talking natural resources. Essential things that mankind needs to exist. And again, remember guys, as we look at this... These all come from the last seal that's unveiled, the last seal that's, that's opened up. We saw that in Revelation verses, uh, chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. And Jesus opens up this last seal, and this last seal reveals these seven trumpet judgments. And every one of these judgments is going to unleash a judgment of God. And so how does this section begin? Well, we read in verse 6. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. Now remember, the last section that we looked at, verses 1 through 6, or verse 1 through 5, that we looked at last week, that in Revelation 8, 1, we read that right before these trumpet judgments unleash, that there was this amazing moment in heaven. Complete silence. And John documents and tells us that it was about 30 minutes of absolute silence in heaven. Now, we're not told specifically why. So we ask the question, why? why? Why is there silence in heaven? And some would say that, well, it's the calm before the storm. That all of heaven is about to witness something so big, so amazing, that they are there standing in complete awe and silence with what is about to fall, befall the earth. And so we see this, And we see this judgment, we read in verse 7. And the first angel sounded his trumpet. And hail and fire followed. It was mingled with blood. And they were thrown uh, to the earth. And a third of the trees were burned up. And all fire and green grass was burned up. Hail and fire followed this first trumpet that was sound. Hail and fire, fire mingled with blood. Now, We see that God is using these judgments, and he he illustrates it in the form of a trumpet. So the trumpet sounds, and the judgment of God comes. Now, what we need to understand is this isn't actually too uncommon. We find this in Scripture where trumpets are used to bring about the judgment of God. How many guys remember the battle of Jericho back in the book of Joshua? 
Remember after Moses passed on, Joshua took over the responsibility to lead the nation of Israel from the wilderness into the promised land. And one of the cities that they came against was the city of Jericho. And this, this city was vast, it was large, it had great walls for its defense. And God told Joshua, hey, you're going to go and take this city. Well, they weren't a massive army by any means with massive weapons and catapults or anything like that that you would think of in the medieval times. And so you would think, how would they overcome the walls of Jericho? And God gave them a very interesting way in which to do that. They were simply to march around the city. Not once, but how many times? You guys remember? Seven times. It's very interesting. It was very curious how God told them to defeat the enemy. They were to walk around the city seven times with seven priests leading the way. And after the seventh day, they were to blow seven trumpets. And as a result, God's judgment came upon the city of Jericho and the walls came down. It was a supernatural work of God. But how it came about was these, these forms of trumpets. Here in Revelation chapter 8, we have seven angels with seven trumpet blasts during the seven-year tribulational period. Each will signal a unique judgment from God. And this first one specifically we read is hail and fire that's mingled with blood. It's reminiscent. What you'll find is that these trumpet judgments are very uh, similar to the judgment that God brought upon Egypt as God used Moses to bring judgment upon Pharaoh in Egypt before they released the children of Israel into the wilderness. You can find that in Exodus chapter 9. It's also interesting that the prophet Joel warned and foreshadowed this judgment to come upon the earth. Listen to this. Joel chapter 2, verse 30 and 31, the prophet Joel said this. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And we see what the judgment will bring and the effects that it will bring of, on all green vegetation around the world. Specifically, we read that a third of the trees and the grass will be burned up. Now remember, this is a supernatural judgment of God in this time known as the tribulational period. Specifically, this is the great tribulation, the last half or last three and a half years of this time of tribulation. And we see that God will bring about this judgment these, on the natural elements. Now, how is this going to unfold? Well, remember at Revelation 8, 5. Look what it said, what, what God said was going to happen, or how this is illustrated for us. And the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and he threw it to the earth, and there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and there were earthquakes. You know, I don't know about you, but when we read a, a, a book like Revelation, where there's these judgments, and it's prophetic, and, and it's very interesting, very curious, very unique, in my mind, I wonder, how will these things actually unfold? What will they actually look like? What will we actually see? Well, one of the things we know is that God um, is uh, going to execute these judgments. And we know that many times God will simply work supernaturally in a very natural way. And so we read there in, in Revelation 8, 5, that there are uh, thunders, that there are lightnings, that there were earthquakes. And so this judgment comes... Many believe, well, it's going to bring lightning strikes all over the world that will cause global fires. Earthquakes will, will uh, uh, afflict the world throughout all these different places. Many believe it will cause volcanic eruption, exploding rock, raining down with fire. And imagine this happening on a global scale, massive volcanic eruption around the globe. There's a scientist who's also a believer by the name of Henry Morris, a creation scientist and Christian apologetist. He, he said this. He said that it's quite possible that worldwide volcanic explosion would be a consequence for worldwide violent earthquakes. That the masses of water vapor blown skyward will condense into intense updraft as hailstone and showers of burning lava will be cast upon the earth. The blood of entrapped men and animals might be mingled with them. And possible showers of liquid water drops might be so contaminated with dust and gases as to appear blood red. 
You know, the most powerful earthquake, or excuse me, volcanic eruption here in the north, in North America, was that of Mount St. Helens in May, on May 18th, 1980. Mount St. Helens erupted, completely wiping out and leveling out everything within an eight-mile radius. Uh, it sent shockwaves down the mountainside where over 19 miles of area where trees were completely toppled over. It sent a mushroom cloud of gas and ash over 12,000 miles up into the Earth's atmosphere um, uh, with an estimated 520 million tons of ash drifting over 2,200 miles, settling over seven different states. It's estimated that that one blast alone, along with the ash, killed well over uh, 7,500 different uh, uh, wildlife animals like deer and elk, bear, and other land animals. That l- rivers that were in the area dried up instantly from the heat of the blast. Rivers, streams, and lakes, they were polluted, causing death of millions of fish, trout, salmon, and others. Um, it said that the fine ash from that blast alone caused major mechanical and electrical uh, shortages uh, and, 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 and problems with electro, elect, electrical transformers causing blackouts throughout the state. Federal agencies estimated that over 2.4 million cubic yards of ash, equivalent to 900 tons in weight, were removed from highways, airports in Washington state. And that was one volcanic eruption. Imagine dozens of these, dozens of these across multiple continents, across the globe, all happening at once. I mean, it'd be, it's, it's, it's imagine what that would be globally amazing. But we know that this first judgment, what it will do is that a third of the trees will burn up and a third of the grass will burn up. We're talking the earth's forests, their jungles, Grass, plants, shrubs, a third of all vegetation, wood, food for production lost. The global effects on all living things, wildlife, livestock, farms, production. Uh, Think of famine and food supplies being absolutely toppled over. And man wondering what in the world could they possibly do. That is the first judgment. But just then, when that finishes, the second judgment begins in verse 8. It says, the second angel sounded his trumpet. And something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. And a third of living creatures in the sea died. And a third of the ships were destroyed, and they were wiped out. The first judgment, trumpet judgment, dealt with the land. But the second focuses in on the sea. Here God judges the sea, which is another major resource for man. And it's interesting how John describes what this looks like. He says there's something like a great mountain that's burning with fire, that's thrown into the sea. Now what could this possibly be? Now we can only speculate, but something that looks like a mountain could be a giant meteorite, an asteroid, I mean, how many times have earth almost been wiped out and the scientists are saying, guys, oh, it it barely passed us by 30 million miles or whatever they might say, right? How many movies have come out talking about giant meteorites hitting the earth? Well, listen, it's going to happen. It's biblical. It's scriptural. It's prophetic that this giant land mass, this giant piece of rock is going to enter into the earth's atmosphere It's going to smash into the sea. It's going to appear as being on fire. Imagine sitting on the evening news as they're filming this giant meteorite coming into the earth. Imagine standing on that continent looking up as that thing comes towards you. It will have some form of location. It's going to specifically land in the sea. And instantly what it's going to do is it's going to become like blood. And a third of the living creatures in the sea will be wiped out. A third of man's ships, transportation, is going to be wiped out. Islands will be swallowed. Coastlines, continents impacted and wiped out. And just think about it, guys. The ocean occupies about three-fourths of the earth's surface. So imagine the global impact this will have. You know, those people that, the save the whale people, they're going to have real difficult time with this, (laughs) for sure. They're going to have real difficult time dealing with this. I also think it's interesting because 
it specifically pinpoints man's resource. It says that their ships will be wiped out, a third of them. That this judgment is meant to destroy and disrupt man's control to navigate the seas, to be able to produce from the seas life and everything that they, they benefit from God's creation. It's God's judgment on man, but it's also God's judgment on his creation. The world oceans and the world's seas. Next, we have the third trumpet judgment. We look at verse 10. It says, And the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch. And it fell on a third of the rivers and of the springs of water. And the name of that star was Wormwood. And a third of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died from the water because it was made bitter. So there's another object that co comes from the sky. Very much, most likely, a similar t type of, of judgment where it's either an asteroid or meteorites. But this one's a little different. John describes this as a great star. However, this falls on the world's rivers um, globally, on all fresh water, on lakes, on rivers and streams. Whatever kind of star or meteorite this might be, it will break apart in the Earth's atmosphere and falling and affecting the globe and its water supply. You know, when you pause and think about the major rivers around the world, let me give you a few. The Nile River runs over 4,200 miles long into 11 different countries. The Amazon River runs about 4,000 miles long. Uh, the Yangtze River, which is Asia's longest river, runs uh, around the same, uh, just a little uh, over 3,800 miles. Here in the north, in North America, we have the great Mississippi River that runs 3,700 miles. That's just four continents. What is described here in the book of Revelation is going to affect the entire world. Imagine those resources, those rivers being polluted to the point that everything within them dies. Yes, the rivers will flow, but they will have little resource for mankind. And why is all this happening? Why do we read of such judgments as judgments of God, the wrath of God? Well, as we studied last week, we looked at that men loved darkness rather than light. But there's more to it. There's more insight that we can get. So hold your spot there in Revelation chapter 8. Turn to your left to the book of Romans. I want you to see this. We're going to read this section here. Romans chapter 1 there, verse 18. We're going to understand and study just a little bit more on why this judgment befalls man and why men, why men have hardened their hearts to the Lord. Revel Romans chapter 1. Notice some of these key aspects. Uh, Romans chapter 1, starting there in verse 18. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. The first thing that we notice is that they suppress truth. They take what, they, what we know to be true and they choose to reject it. Verse 19. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, they are clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. Nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts. And foolishness, a uh, foolish in their hearts, they were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. You know, this section reveals to us some really interesting things that you and I already know to be true. Remember, Romans was written in, you know, 60, 70 um, A.D., I mean, this was thousand years before our time. And yet Paul nails on the head the very thing that keeps man from a relationship with Jesus Christ today. We read there in verse 19 that God has revealed himself in his creation. In other words, what we see points us to a creator. 
what we grasp points us to something bigger than just ourselves. I mean, we know this when you look at tribal people, when we look at people that maybe don't have the technology or modern day knowledge or modern day science or medicine, and yet they understand that there is something much bigger than themselves. And it's in the creation that God reveals this to us. So much so that read verse 20, it says that they are without excuse to acknowledge that there is a creator. It's interesting because Paul says in verse 21 that that although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. You see, there's a process in which man comes to a point of rejecting the Lord. It doesn't just happen overnight. You don't wake up and say, I reject God. It happens through a hardening of man's heart to the things revealed, the things that are true, but also they become futile in their thinking and their hearts becoming dark. We read in verse 22, professing to be wise, they become fools. See, what happens is man studies the world, the universe, creation. They study it. And as they learn and grow in knowledge, they think they know better than that of God. In fact, they would say so much so that there has to be another way. There has to be another way in which mankind exists apart from God. Why? Because they raise their fists to God. And they come to this, this false conclusion that there is no God. That we evolved. That we, can, that we went from the, from the goo to the zoo to you. That's what they'll say. And this really anti-Christ ideology of atheism, which, again, didn't always exist. But man had to come up with a way to deny the existence of God. And what do they seek to use? What little science they think they grasp and understand. But the more that we understand science, the more we pinpoint and realize it's not so simple as the atheist, agnostic, evolutionist would say. They said that over millions of years, that which was simple grew more complex, but that's not true. It's been complex from the beginning because that's the way God designed it. God made it that way. We read in verse 23, the process, the stages of man hardening their heart. Verse 23, and they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. The birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. In other words, this. They began to worship the creation rather than the creator. And we see this like no other. Where mankind, they desire to, to take care of the earth. They call it mother. Mother what? Earth. Right? You've heard that. It's interesting that they would harden their heart to the Lord. They're hardening their heart against God. Look what it says in Romans 1, 24. Let's read the rest of the section. It's kind of lengthy, I know, but I think it's important for us to grasp, grasp the hardness of man's heart. Verse 24, it says, Because of this, because of them rejecting the Lord, verse 24, Therefore God has also given them up to uncleanliness in the lust of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie. They worship and serve the creature rather than creator, who is blessed forever. And for this reason, God gave them to vile passions. For their, even their women exchanged their natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also men leaving the natural use of the woman, burn in their lust for another, men with men, committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which is due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, they didn't want nothing to do with God, God gave them over to a debased mind, to those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, Sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, self-disease, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters. Next one is very interesting. Haters of what? God. Violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things. Disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrusting, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, 
that those who practice such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but also, uh, but also approve of those things who practice them. That's heavy-duty stuff. Again, I hope you understand in seeing the, the progression of the hardness of men's hearts, where they exchange what is true for a lie, what is natural for the things that are unnatural. And as a result, God gave them over to these things, to worship the creation, well, rather than the creator. It just baffles me when you look at our cultures today. And it's not new, guys. Listen, this was written long ago. And Paul nails it on the head because it, it, it explicitly speaks of our culture today. Interesting. Again, they worship, they rather hug earth than hug the Lord. Love earth than love God. Just yesterday I was reading an article that the New York Times published about saving the Amazon forest. As you guys know, that there's been fires burning throughout the Amazon forest, uh, month-long fires destroying uh, hundreds of thousands of acres. And, and, and what they do, is they, th- these individuals, these naturalists, they want to save the earth, and so they want to do everything they can to pledge preserving the, the Amazon forest. And let me just make it clear. It is the job of the Christian, and it is the job of mankind to preserve what God has entrusted to us. I'm a fly fisherman. I believe I practice catch and release. I, I, not that I, I'll, I'll keep a few fish here and there from my tummy. I'm okay with that too. But I believe that we ought to take care of the resources that God has given us. Let's make that clear. So I believe in federal governments and and local governments preserving land and and taking care of it and and the the proper harvest of animals and deer and elk and things of that nature. But they take it to a fifth degree. They take it to such a place. And this article in the New York Times basically want it to do everything they can to make it a crime against humanity if you should ruin or destroy any part of the Amazon forest. Now, a part of me says, well, I agree. But on the other side, I ask, well, what about the crime of killing the unborn children? On the one side, they say, save the whales. But on the other, they're killing unborn children. They deify one and demonize the other. Why? Because of men's hearts. According to the world ometers, there are approximately 40 to 50 million abortions globally annually, every year. 40 to 50 million children are killed. And the majority of that is simply out of convenience. I don't have the time. I don't want to. I just want to have my sex and my fun, and I don't want the responsibility that comes with it. So when we come across sections like this, this this judgment upon God, and we think, man, why is God pouring this out upon upon the earth. Well, God is taking back. God is bringing judgment upon the very resources and and natural ecology of man to show that that is not their God. That cannot save them. And so we read this, this judgment back in Revelation, this trumpet judgment of God bringing judgment, this third angel sounding, a great star falling from heaven, affecting a third of the rivers and the spring. Verse 11, and the name of that star, it's called Wormwood, and a third of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because it made it bitter. Wormwood simply means something that is poisoned. It's undrinkable. It's tainted. It's made bitter. And if you were to consume these waters, they would affect you in a way in which you most likely would die. You and everything in it, all wildlife around it. And I believe that, again, these are things, these are revelation of things that were predicted long ago. I mean, the prophet uh, Jeremiah spoke of this. He gave us a preview of this. In Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 13 and 15, it says here, The Lord said, uh, because they have forsaken my law, which I set before them, because they have not obeyed my voice, not walking according to it, but have walked after their stubbornness of their own heart, after their Baals, their false gods, as their fathers taught them. Therefore says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will feed them, this people, with wormwood, 
and will give them poisoned water to drink. Jeremiah 9, 13 through 15. That's what we're seeing being fulfilled here in Revelation. Again, God's judgment being poured out on the ecology of the world. The last trumpet that we have this morning is, is in verses 12 and 13. We read in verse 12, Then a fourth of the angels sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened, and a third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. And I looked, and I heard an angel flying throughout the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe! And woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of, of, of three angels who are about to sound. So we see that this fourth judgment, the last one that we're going to look at this morning, it's the fourth trumpet judgment. The sun, the moon, the stars are struck by God. We've seen God strike the land. We see God strike the oceans. We see God strike the rivers, and now mankind looking up into the sky, heavenward, God brings global darkening to a third of the world. How will this come about? Well, we can only speculate, but some will say it will come about through eclipse. It will come about through the sun losing massive amounts of energy, stars falling from the sky, Again, this is very reminiscent of God's judgment on Egypt. If you go back and read uh, Exodus chapter 10, God brought judgment like this upon Egypt of darkness, causing uh, stars to fall upon the land. It's very interesting. Uh, According to uh, the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions, they're estimating that the next 25 to 30 years that roughly 35% of, of energy that's used Will, solely, will, will completely be solar by that time. That's what they're hoping to accomplish. So if 35% of the world's energy supply comes from the sky, that's a third of its energy resource. Now again, that it can be just coincidence. We don't know. The scripture is clear. God will wipe out a third of the sun, of the stars, of the moon. Luke 21 Uh, Verse 25 and 26, Jesus said this. He said, there will be signs in the sun. There will be signs in the moon. There will be signs in the stars. And on the earth, distress of nations. On the earth, perplexities. The seas and the waves roaring. Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Mankind will not know what to do. Distress of nations with perplexity. Listen, this is what's going to happen without a shadow of doubt. These things begin to befall. The world will instantly grab its leading scientist and say, what are we supposed to do? What can we do? How can we save Mother Earth? (laughs) That's what they're going to do. And they're going to do everything in their power to to preserve water and preserve food and preserve themselves. And yet they will be doing that in their own accord, out of their own strength, out of their own supposed wisdom of man. And this is all coming because of God's judgment. Realize this, though. During this whole process, God is still welcoming and receiving mankind to himself. They can still come into right relationship with God. But listen, what you're going to find as we continue in Revelation, they know this judgment is from God. And rather than turn to the Lord, you know what they do? They raise their fists at God and stand in complete defilement against him. They puff their chest. They they, they lift up their fists because they would rather die in judgment than bend the knee and yield. Pride, arrogance, hardness of heart, that's what those things are. We look at these judgments. I mean, guys, these are, these are global things that are going to happen. Darkness, no more sun. A third of that's going to be wiped out. No more, I mean, I don't know about you, but I like the sun. 
I like warm, warm weather. I like, but you imagine the sun completely, the sun stopped shining. The, the, the atmospheric conditions that are going to change on earth. Here's what's interesting. The sun's going to be removed for a time, for a season. In the judgments that's to come, in the bold judgments, the sun is going to be unleashed with fervent heat. So much so, it's going to be a total climate change around the world where there's going to be extra amount of heat and the, the sun's going to scorch mankind. They're going to face it all. And we ask the question, can these things get worse? Can it get even worse than this? What's the answer? Yes, it will be. So much so, look what God says, God's word says in verse 13 of Revelation 8. It says, and I looked, and I heard an angel flying to the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Because of the remaining blasts of the, of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. Once again, there's still three more judgment, judgments to come in this, in this area of these trumpet judgments. But before they come, God sends an angel to say, watch out because you haven't seen anything yet. It's going to get worse. These woes are again telling mankind to embrace themselves. There is still more to come. So why, why do we have the book of Revelation? Because if you stop and think, the Lord has revealed to mankind what is about to befall it. It's a warning. It's a stirring. Remember, the book of Revelation for the church is a book of hope. It doesn't look, not, not for the inhabitants of the earth during this time, but for you and I, for the church, well, according to our eschatology, what we believe is that the church will be raptured bef long before this time takes place. Well, we will be with the Lord. But it's also the hope that God will fulfill his word, that the return of Christ will come, that the day of the Lord will come and he will vindicate all sin. He will make every wrong right. And he will, it will establish himself here on earth, the righteous rule of God. You see, the reason why we read and study such a book is to be prepared, to be readied, to be equipped. A couple of verses that tell us about this. Matthew 25, 13 tells us to be on alert then. For you do not know the day nor the hour. To be ready to anticipate. To keep your eyes looking up. To look to the Lord. Luke 12, 40. Jesus said this. He says, therefore, be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. To be ready to be prepared. And how are we to be ready? How are we to be prepared? Listen, is to be looking for the great hope, to be looking to Christ. There's a lot of things in our lives, guys, we can look at. There's a lot of things in our lives that occupy us. You have careers you're pursuing. You have your future hopes and dreams. You have relationships there's, there's, uh, there's things that you're passionate about. There's hobbies and sports. There's all these things that consume us. And in and of themselves, those things are not sinful or wrong. But what happens too often, they take greater priority than that of the Lord. They take greater precedence. We look and hope for these. We get excited about these. We want these. More so than just spending time with Jesus, looking to Jesus. And so the key to us isn't to have to throw all those things away. It's simply put it in the right priority. Make Jesus first and foremost preeminent in your lives. And ensure that everything else falls underneath that. Because here's the reality. Until Christ comes, we still have a job to do. We still have much to live for. We live unto the Lord. We live for one another, our family, our friends, our church. We live for the lost, wanting to reach them for Jesus. To, to prove to them that Christianity is not just in word only, but also in deed and in truth. And so we have purpose while we wait for Christ to come. 
And so the way that we are ready is to be looking to Jesus this morning. And as we read and study this letter, these, this book, these trumpet judgments, the things that are about to unfold, these future events, these apocalyptic events, we do, we do so through the eyes of looking to Jesus. That's what this book is all about, guys. As much as we see these things fascinating, the Antichrist, that, that's freaky and crazy, you know, the Antichrist possessed by Satan, the, the beast, the false prophet, the, you know, the, the mark of the beast, six, and we look at all these things, we go, whoa, that's crazy. That's very interesting. You know, as a young Christian growing up in the church, Revelation was like one of those like, whoa, weird, esoteric, mystical books. And it's like, well, you would read it and you would get your mind blown. But it's actually very simplistic. The book of Revelation is about Jesus. It is the revelation of Jesus. It is the anticipation of Jesus coming back. And so let's make him first. Let's make him foremost. Let's pursue him. And you can do that. You're here today. Praise the Lord. You've come today. That's awesome. But listen, tomorrow is Monday. It starts off your week. Start it with Jesus. And you got Tuesday. You got a bad day on Monday. We'll continue it with Jesus on Tuesday. And you have Wednesday, hump week. Just get over the week. Get over the hump. Make it through it. And you have Thursday, Friday, where you're plugging away, sharing the gospel, reading your Bible, seeking the Lord. You got the weekend. Saturday's rest day. Oh, and then you're back at church. And we, we do that day after keeping Jesus the focal point and the priority. And if we do that, we will have right perspective. We'll be equipped. We'll be ready for every good thing that the Lord has from now until he comes back for his church. So may we be that church that's ready, that's prepared, that's anticipating him coming back. Amen? Amen. Father, we are blown away by this section. <laughs>